Welcome to the Visionary Chronicles, a business strategy podcast where we provide insight to those looking for creative, executable strategies built around the latest disruptive ideas, innovative cultures, product creators, and marketing solutions. Welcome to the Visionary Chronicles. Today, we're going to take another chapter in the book, The Visionary Brand, The Success Formula Behind the World's Most Visionary Brands. And again, thank you for those that have purchased the book. But more importantly, as I always say, is those that have applied what we put into the book and talked to me about how it's either benefited them personally or professionally. It was also a reader's favorite award winner for best nonfiction marketing genre business book. That's a mouthful but also an Amazon bestseller. So thank you again for those of you that purchased the book. But again, those that have been able to apply it and talk to us about it and have us mention this and talk about it in our podcast. So today we're going to talk about the UX, what I call in the book, the UX, which is the user engagement strategies. And I always put a quote, as you know, in the front end of my podcast, And I felt this one was very appropriate with Steve Jobs. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious after a while. That's because they're able to connect experiences they've had and synthesize these new things. And what I love about that quote, and what we'll talk about today on the user engagement experience is it's truly a life cycle experience. You're providing a need and value to your customer and really providing something beyond what I call product. You know, there's too many brands and we deal with this with Liquid Mind, the brands that I've been with personally, global iconic brands. And what's interesting many times is they don't think about the engagement side of it. It's critical today when you talk about engagement, especially post-purchase. And we kind of go back to the old school marketing life cycle side of engaging with a customer, having them choose a preference, and eventually them becoming your customer, purchasing your product. It's just kind of this funnel. It's a very traditional marketing funnel, but today we're going to talk about, we had talked about, if you haven't, if you haven't heard it, the previous podcast that we had mentioned, the loyalty loop. And that's really where everything has transitioned and why we can really talk about and why I've dedicated a full chapter in the book to engagement. Is it so important and critical today that you engage with your consumers, even those that have not purchased yet and those that have purchased? The previous marketing strategy, and and many of you, believe it or not, are still doing this, is that once your customer has purchased, you don't engage with them anymore. You know, for me, what you're doing is you're losing out on lifetime customer value, which is the lifeblood of your brand and your company. So I feel this subject is so important, and I get many questions, and I engage with our brands many times on this loyalty loop strategy. But today we're going to talk about the engagement itself. You know, what is user engagement? And a lot of times when I ask that question to our brands and the leader of the brands that we work with through Liquid Mind, we'll kind of, again, as we, as we do many times, we'll whiteboard this thing and they'll ask them, I say, what do you think user engagement is? And they'll say responding to social media posts, responding to blog comments, whatever that means. And those are important for sure. But when you talk about user engagement, it's even pre-comments. You know, brands that are successful, and look at these brands, and I'll give you a few examples of how these great brands engage, is that they'll provide value before product purchase. And they'll provide value post-purchase that may have nothing to do with the product. And Patagonia would be a great example of this. Patagonia uh, looks at how they can provide value to their customer, whether it be through user experience with the product itself or what they believe in as a brand, the motto of their brand in saving our environment, but also enjoying our environment. 
And by saying that they enjoy the environment, they can utilize the Patagonia product through the performance of what they have and what they can do as a brand and as a product and a performance-driven strategy that they have around who they're selling their products to. So when we talk about user engagement, this happens early and it happens frequently. And you can provide value to your current or potential customers. We talked about that. So of course, value can take several forms and function most powerfully, it can be offered through personalization. And that's really kind of what I want to focus on today is this personalization aspect of, of engagement. Is with artificial intelligence today, and if you haven't heard the previous podcast about artificial intelligence and how to apply that to your marketing strategy, please go back and, and listen to that podcast. We've gotten some great comments on that, and it really applies to what we're talking about today because personalization has really come a long ways just in the last few years. And what's really cool about it is we see this progressing day after day, not just year after year, but really day after day. So when we look at personalization, this bonds the customer to your brand lifestyle. You know, as we had seen, and, and again, in previous podcasts, what I talk about is how do you provide value beyond your product? You know, everybody wants to feel wanted and understood in this marketplace, no matter what you sell. So find a way to engage your customers, but at the same time, provide value. You know, that's one thing I get, feel it gets lost in the mix when we talk about social media posts, commenting, blog comment, posts, engagement. The line that I draw is, and I ask this question to our brands and the leaders of our brands, is what value do you think that comment is providing to your customer that asked the question? For instance, we put a quote up on the board and we say, and this is something that is a reactive versus a proactive strategy around personalization, is let's say that somebody bought your tent, let's say as an outdoor brand, and we work with outdoor brands that do sell tents, happens to be a case study. So what the question was is, where are some great trails that can I utilize my new tent on an outdoor experience that may be next to rivers within Colorado? So when we looked at it, we said, well, we should have been proactive with providing a solution to our customer for that question before it was asked. And that's really what we talk about in personalization. It's being proactive, number one. Number two is providing answers to questions that have not yet been asked. So what it does is it effectively brings your customer back, not for an additional purchase, although they're probably going to be doing that because now they're loyal to your brand and they're coming back because you're providing value to them on an experience that they have with your product that's provided, just so happens to be provided through your brand. And this can be basketball, this can be football, this can be service, whatever it, whatever it is. Again, everybody wants to feel wanted and understood, no matter what you sell. So the closer you can match an experience to an individual needs, the closer you come to building what we call a relationship with the customer, eventually turning them into a brand advocate. And what is a brand advocate? Well, they become part of your community. They're, or, or you go to another level and they're ambassadors for your brand, part of the brand, meaning that you're effectively paying them for being part of your brand, but they already are a believer in your product. But they also provide reviews that are authentic and honest. That's an ambassador that's different from an advocate. So these are extremely important when you try to engage and provide value to your customer beyond product. And many times this gets lost in translation. And that's why I always ask that question. And, and what I would do as a leader of your brand, and, and when you're talking with your management team, is ask them that question when you talk about engagement. As a brand, what do we classify as proper engagement with our brand? And what do we think is useful to our customers? 
those that have either purchased our product or those that are looking to purchase our product and how do you move them away from our current customers and provide value and gain market share? So engaging with these current customers within the what we call this loyalty loop. And just to give you a refresher on that, again, I would go back. If you haven't s- listened to it, I would go back and listen to the loyalty loop. Um, it'll give you more context around this kind of summary that I'll give you. So as I'd mentioned before, when you talk about previous marketing strategies, really it was this funnel concept, right? It was when you look at engaging with a customer, acquiring a customer, customer eventually becoming a customer, purchasing your products, and then you would spit them out through the back end and you would move on to acquiring your next customer without any further engagement. Now with the loyalty loop, you're looking at customer lifetime, lifetime customer value. You know, how do you build revenue in a relationship with a customer through a relationship? And that's really what the loyalty loop is all about. You snap them up when they come out of the bottom of that funnel after purchasing, and then you really start engaging with them again. And that's really important because, again, I'll go back to, everyone wants to feel wanted and understood no matter what you sell. So loyalty loop is extremely critical to your brand's lifeblood. And nobody wants to lose customers, but I can guarantee you that if you don't have this strategy in place of engagement and proper loyalty loop strategy, you're going to lose customers and it's gonna become infinitely difficult for you to grow revenue as a result. So engaging with current customers within the loyalty loop and securing new customers is, is kind of this, what do we call this really delicate balance for brands you know visionary brands and that's what we talk about in the book and the ones that i've been with the ones that i've studied the ones that i put in the book and the case studies that are in there use a clearly defined what we call ux user engagement an engagement strategy to balance value with acquisition effectively don't always be asking be giving Give, 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 ask. Give, 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 ask. Provide value before asking. The value proposition can cross over to the acquisition side, but its approach is much, much different as it matches lifestyle enhancement versus price point compression. And what I mean by that is that you're not a commodity brand. I mean, that's really not what we're selling here and who we're talking to. Commodity brands, the strategy around them building revenue is to not innovate, but to imitate and to have price point compression within a product category, selling a similar product from a brand that has been successful with it. I know that's a mouthful, but really that's what it is. So when you look at what your strategy is, Value, again, is building a marketing strategy around your brand lifestyle. So you really need to know what you stand for as a brand and what your point of difference is from other brands within your category. And it's okay to look at other brands, whether they're in your category or whether they're not in your category. It could be somebody in service. But if they've got a great user engagement strategy and they know how to provide value before acquisition. And you look at their customer attrition rates, I can tell you and almost guarantee you again that they are maintaining customer base and they're enhancing customer lifetime value as a result. So once a customer has joined the brand community, let's just say the community, and that's important to make that distinction. Because when they become a purchaser of your product, you want them to be part of your brand community, provide value to them. You know, they adapt to the brand's product life cycles and choose either early adopter or late adopter product acquisition timing. And what you want, the ideal scenario, and this is a risky one for many brands and Apple's been able to pull it off, is that you want the customers on the front end of that early adopter stage. So there is no price point compression, but you wanna be able to have previous generations go on the backside for late adopters. 
so they can embrace your brand through its entire life cycle value and you don't have price point compression and as a result your margins stay intact so once your brand once your customer again has enjoyed joined your brand community they'll adapt to that product life cycle Again, I go back to asking the question, you don't need an iPhone 15, it's that they want an iPhone 15 because of how Apple has marketed the product and the value of that product to your customer. So a brand's ability to know where their customers are on the adoption curve will tip that marketing investment scale relative to messaging, personalization, social engagement, in addition to lifetime customer value will grow as a result. So this kind of becomes that fine art of being able to read demographic profiles, engage with personalization, and consistently messaging lifestyle improvements through the adoption cycle that your customers choose. And the other thing is that trying to move a customer from late adopter, early adopter isn't a great strategy. What you want to do is embrace that late adopter, provide products to them continually through this life cycle, and give them value for the product as well. You need them on the backside. You need them on Gen 2 products. So don't think that you're only going to personalize on the front end. Although the value is greater, the customer base is larger on the late adopter side. So again, it's a fine art, and brands that are visionary have figured out how to read these again demographic profiles engaging with personalization consistently messaging lifestyle improvements to the adoption cycles your customers choose so make sure that you have these in place these advocates are the ones that allow you to control your brand's destiny so embrace them but it's not always easy i get it so you know as a great example you know before direct to consumer channel opportunities, brands would engage through one-way external communications. You remember these mailers and flyers and unsolicited emails, you know, all of these different things. None of these which allows the kind of personalizing, personalization that we can get today. Think of that. I mean, even, even an email you get today where it's addressed as your first name. You know, I get these all the time. Hello, call, you know, Colin, you know, um, hello, comma, hello, hello, no personalization. Nothing personalized as far as the messaging and what I may need and what I may be looking for in personalizing the email messaging. So make sure that you understand that you've got a customer on the front end and you've got a customer on the back end, each looking for a different type of product. And it could be price point, it could be functionality, it could be a service level, whatever it happens to be, customize and personalize. And, you know, this world is a whole lot different now. You know, these brands are in the driver's seat. And that's why you see the D2C growing so significantly. And retailers have embraced working with the brands and having the brands take the lead. You know, it's an essential, uh, essential what I say, is a shift in the culture. As brands want to control their engagement across all their strategies. And, and I talk about this also in the omni-channel podcast. So take a look at that one as well. So, you know, in maintaining your destiny, you know, they can define all aspects of the purchase loop, which again, previously brands didn't always have that control. They didn't have a big direct consumer business, so they can control the aspects of the entire purchase journey with your customer. So now they can. You know, in maintaining their destiny, they can define all aspects of the purchase loop from marketing to product cycles, engagement platforms, direct communications with their customers in store or online. You know, and you, you have to know and where to drive this shift. And even as your brand is, is more equipped to secure its future, there's also a need to understand the what I call these intricacies of building developing and growing brand awareness and equity as a result. So with time, it's, I'm gonna say it's relatively easy, but there's a lot of tools out there now and artificial intelligence has made our life a lot easier. And 
The warning that I'm giving the leaders of brands is with artificial intelligence, yes, it's a great tool and I'm 100% on board with it. It's made our life easier working with brand strategies with, with brands and go-to-market strategies and whatever it may be, but don't do it for the sake of doing it. Make sure that you have a strategy around why you're implementing artificial intelligence, and that's really goes for anything, but in particular with artificial intelligence. And we ask the question also when we whiteboard and ask the leaders of your brand, well, if you want to implement artificial intelligence, again, how are you going to implement it? Where are you going to implement it? Who's going to be in control of the metrics, the dashboard, the constant maintenance of artificial intelligence to ensure consistency and authentic authentication is in place. So engage with your current customers, stay true to your brand foundation and build trust in loyalty while advocating the virtues of your products and the value of your products to the consumer. You know, these current advocates are the company's most valuable asset and will assist also through your community to acquire new members into your community. You know, that's one thing many brands overlook as well is that when you build this community, they will come and they come through the value that you provide. And if you just look at the attention span today, think of that three, four second attention span. You know, it's not even an elevator speech anymore. It's getting through the door speech. So you need to really understand and anchor your brand foundation, who you stand for, what your point of difference is, and they will become a valuable asset to you continuing to grow your brand. So they can be measured and, and engaged and activated or they can be ignored and i can tell you there's many more brands that are ignoring them than those that are engaging authentically with these customers so last point on this one is that ensure that you engage and don't ignore you know always engage but the context of engaging is value again i'll go back to the example of asking the question do you feel a social media post where you respond to a comment provided value or did not provide value within the context of what the principles are of foundational personalization of your brand to your customers. You know, so again, ensure you don't ignore, always engage, always provide value beyond your product and you'll be rewarded with a mutually beneficial relationship, which is always great. And why commod commodity brands always struggle if your only competitive advantage is price point and your only competitive advantage is to imitate and not innovate, you don't have any competitive advantages. It's just a matter of the next door that you go down with a similar product and a lower price point and you finding a way to move your price point even lower and you get price point compression and margin compression. You don't want that. And those aren't the ones I'm talking to. And these aren't the brands that engage with liquid mind. So again, Make sure that you take care of your customers and they'll take care of you. Um, the second big point when we talk about um, user engagement is empathize. And what I mean by empathize is understanding and empathizing with your customer brings a personal touch to your creations. You know, empathy is understanding your customer's world, perceptions, values, and providing products or solutions that can enhance their lifestyle, either through products or processes, whatever it happens to be. Again, I'll, I'll go through this again, which is not a lot of people think about this empathy side of, of personalization and customer engagement. It's this understanding of your customer's world, perceptions and values and providing products or solutions that enhance their lifestyle, either through better products or processes. Everybody wants to be a better basketball player. Anybody, everybody wants to be a better football player. Everybody wants to be a better runner. And these are hobbies I'm talking about, which are outdoor hobbies, obviously, but I'm talking about anything. Through services being more efficient, more effective on your job or on your role. These are all things that are enhancements to your lifestyle through value provided from the brand itself. 
So the personal touch perspective reflects with simple sophistication, you know, we had discussed earlier. And discussed earlier through simple is sophisticated. You know, bringing your vision or a better way to life, you know, simplicity in the product design, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the sophistication is how it makes your world better, your customer's world better. Visionary brands find this both challenging and enlightening. You know, when it comes to realization, they've commercialized the product that they know is going to make their customer's life better. It's enlightening. And they're passionate about it. And it makes you leave your comfort zone and move into the reality of a solution you want to provide to your customer. It drives ongoing passion for the product and how it improves not only your life, but the customer and the community, saving time, improving relationships, being more efficient or effective. Whatever the motive is, you know, creating this product is a labor of love for the brand design team, the marketing team, the operations team. Everybody wants to breathe life into this vision. And that's all done through a visionary leader of a visionary brand. And once they breathe life into that, the brand is never the same. But what you have to be looking for here when you're sitting in the room and trying to identify a innovative product, much less a disruptive product solution. You know, is this a solution looking for a problem or a problem looking for a solution? You have to answer that question. You know, finding a solution for the sake of just doing something is not a strategy. So as simple as this question sounds, many brands have yet to ask it, much less venturing forward. They're really effectively what I call blinded by the short-sightedness. They don't want to take risk. And I always say with Seth Godin's comment was dead on is safe is risky. It's kind of an oxymoron when you think about it, but it's a great quote from Seth because if you're not risking, you can't do anything innovative and you can't do anything disruptive. So finding solutions to everyday problems is an easier path to success as it can be translated more effectively and realized quicker by end users. You know, this beauty of simple sophistication, finding a solution is found in its application in the real world, where this idea becomes reality. In creating solutions, there's a way to connect the community to the brand and eventually to a product ecosystem fully integrated with their daily life. Think of a life without Apple. It's fully integrated into your life. Look at all the different areas of those that ecosystem that you use. So to drive, the drive to, to join this ecosystem is driven by empathy. The empathy of knowing what your customer wants. Apple knows what we want. It's not always great in the beginning. I'll tell you, I'm an Apple shareholder and there's a lot of things I'm frustrated with. And, but there are a lot of things that I love about Apple. So it's driven by empathy as the customer is looking for solutions that are not yet reality, but are opportunities to simplify their life. Now, this is where you want to find and build your strategy and anchor it, okay? When we talk about what do I do and how do I start? So this drive to join the ecosystem is driven by empathy. And what is that? As the customer is looking for solutions that they're not yet reality, but are opportunities to simplify their life. So throughout the visionary brand, you know, I really wanted to make sure this point was brought out in the user experience and engagement because there's so much confusion about it. Like, what is it? Is it social media posts? Is it is it engaging on Facebook? Is it engaging on Twitter? Yeah, those are great. But really, this is about having your customer one-on-one. -on -one. And one-on-one -on -one means that you have these communities can be one-on-one. -on -one. So large brands, small brands, everybody can benefit from this. So throughout the visionary brands, we've discussed these vertical brand, what we call touch points. The more interconnected they become, the more diverse the ecosystem becomes, 
to satisfy the needs of many while personalizing the experience of each. Think of how powerful that is for your brand and company to be able to personalize experiences with your community. So empathy may seem intangible, but the more tangible a brand makes this connection, the more it finds how much products have impacted individuals, families, communities across all of its customers. It's a beautiful thing to see, really. You know, if you stop thinking about the next great product and you think about the products they already have, whether it be a competitor's products or your products, how to make it simpler for them, easier to use, making them more effective, more efficient, more powerful, better performance, whatever it happens to be. Empathy is an intuition about when something suits the brand and can genuinely impact a person's life. I talk about this in the visionary brand and it's a counterintuitive thing to most people think about personalization and engagement. When you give a person the ability to spend more time at home with the family or a loved one, this value becomes tangible. Visionary brands understand the impact of this tangible value and, and ultimately revenue growth will follow as a result. Visionary brands think beyond products. They value the solutions their products provide to their community and their customers. You know, ultimately building a visionary user experience is about putting together building blocks to form a purchase. You're searching for a seamless execution of a brand that knows and wants the needs of its customers. And the better they know these customers, the better the experience and the engagement with these customers. In any step along the way, whether it's shipping a product late, not a stock position, all these are part of the customer journey, not just once, but customer lifetime value. So understand your customers. Empathy for improving their lives will help you find solutions to give them what they currently don't have more of, which is time, family, money, and life. Think of these different things. Every brand can solve these solutions no matter what it is. Let this empathy fuel your brand interactions and product pipelines. This will make you visionary in your customer's eyes and your brand a valuable part of their everyday lives. So thank you again for listening to the Visionary Chronicles. As always, I know you're busy. I appreciate your time. I always say stay true, stay authentic, be different, and be great, and enjoy the journey along the way. Thank you for listening to the Visionary Chronicles today. Really appreciate your time. Realize that you're extremely busy. And thank you to those also that have made us the number one visionary and top 50 marketing global podcasts as ranked by Feedspot. Also, thank you to those that have also purchased the visionary brand, the success formula behind the world's most visionary brands, making us a Amazon bestseller, as well as winning the reader's favorite award for best nonfiction marketing genre book, still available through all distribution channels. And also, if you like what you hear with the Visionary Chronicles podcast, please subscribe or forward this to someone you know that may enjoy what we're talking about with the Visionary Chronicles. And you'll also get a free ebook edition. And it's available through all subscriptions, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeart, Google Podcasts, all available for subscription no matter what you listen to. And also, with the release of the Visionary brand, we're also just finished our master course located at thevisionaryfiles.com. It's a 18 video learning courses, almost two hours of visionary lessons on what we're talking about with the Visionary brand today. So if you could pass this along as well, again, it's available at thevisionaryfiles.com. Just finished that this quarter. We have over 2,100 entrepreneurs and brand leaders who have already taken the course. 
And also, if you have any questions on the podcast, feel free to reach out to me at Liquid Mind, where we have free meetings that we provide. Um, We also partner with startups, mid to large cap consumer brands, empowering these businesses to think differently, be different. We drive a passionate culture and to tell them to execute relentlessly. I'm available at liquidmindsight, SIT.com. Also, Brian at liquidmindsight.com and also Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to me. Always love to hear your comments and feedback.